Now I see book 16, Odysseus reveals himself to Telemachus. Meanwhile, Odysseus and his wife had lit a fire in the hut and were getting breakfast ready at daybreak, for they had sent the men out with the pigs. When Telemachus came up, the dogs did not bark, but fawned upon him. So Odysseus, hearing the sound of feet and noticing that the dogs did not bark, said to Eumaeus, Eumaeus, I hear footsteps. I suppose one of your men or someone of your acquaintance is coming here, for the dogs are fawning upon him and not barking. The words were hardly out of his mouth before his son stood at the door. Eumaeus sprang to his feet, and the bowels, the bowls in which he was mixing wine, fell from his hands as he made towards his master. He kissed his head and both his wives and wept for joy. A father could not be more delighted at the returning of an only son, the child of his old age, after ten years' absence in a foreign country, and after having gone through much hardship, he embraced him, kissed him all over as though he had come back from the dead, and spoke fondly to him, saying, So, you are come, tell Marcus lies in my eyes that you are, when I heard you had gone to Pylos, I made sure I was never going to see you any more. Come in, my dear child, and sit down, that I may have a good look at you now that you are home again. It is not very often that you come into the country to see us herdsmen. You stick pretty close to the town generally. I suppose you think it better to keep an eye on what the supers are doing, so be it, old friend, answered to Telemachus, but I am come now because I want to see you and to learn whether my mother is still at her old home or whether someone else has married her, so that the bed of Odysseus is without bedding and covered with cobwebs. She is still at the house replied to Eumaeus, grieving and breaking her heart, and doing nothing but weep, both night and day continually. As he spoke, he took Telemachus' fear, whereon he crossed the stone threshold, and came inside Odysseus, rose from his seat to give his in the place. As he entered, and Telemachus checked him, sit down, stranger, said he, I can easily find another seat, and there is one here who will lay it for me. Odysseus went back to his own place, and Eumaeus strewed some green brushwood on the floor, and threw a sheepskin on top of it for Telemachus to sit upon. Then the swine herd brought them platters of cold meat, the remains from what they had eaten the day before, and he filled the bread baskets with bread as fast as he could. He mixed the wine also in the balls of the ivy wood, and took a seat facing Odysseus. Then they laid their hands on the good things that were before them. And as soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Telemachus said to Eumaeus, old friend, where is the stranger come from? How did his crew bring him to Ithaca? And who were they? For assuredly, they did not come here by land. To this you answered, O swine, heard Eumaeus, my son, I will tell you the real truth. He says he is a Cretan, and that he has been a great traveler. At this moment he is running away from the Thesprotean ship and has taken a refuge at my station, so I will put him into your hands. Do whatever you like with him. Only remember that he is your suppliant. I am very much distressed, said Telemachus, by what you have just told me. How can I take the stranger into my house? I am as yet young and am not strong enough to hold my own if any man attacks me, my mother cannot make up her mind whether to stay where she is and look after the house out of respect for her public opinion and the memory of her husband, or whether the time has not come for her to take the best man of those who are wooing her and the one who will make her the most advantageous offer. Still, as a stranger has come to your station, I will find him a cloak and a shirt of good wear, with a sword and sandals, and will send him wherever he wants to go. Or if you like, you can keep him here at the station, and I will send him clothes and food that he may be no burden on you and on your men. But I will not have him go near the suitors, for they are very insolent, and are sure to ill treat him in a way that would greatly grieve me, no matter how valiant a man may be when he can do nothing against numbers, for they will be too strong for him. Then Odysseus said, Sir, it is your right hand, I should say something myself. I am a much shocked about what you have said about the insolent way in which the suitors are behaving in spite of such men as you are. Tell me, do you submit to such treatment tamely, or has some God say more people against you? May you not complain of your brothers, for it is the beast that a man may look for support, however great this quarrel may be. I wish I were as young as you are, and in my present mind, if I were sent to Odysseus, or indeed Odysseus himself, I would rather someone came and cut my head off, but I wouldn't go to the house and be the bane of every one of those men. If they were too many for me, I being single handed, I would rather die fighting in my own house than see such disgraceful sights day after day. Strangers were now treated and dragging the women's servants out of the house and unseemly by wine drawn recklessly and were wasted all to no purpose or an end that shall never be accomplished. And Telemachus answered, I will tell you truly everything there is in an enmity between me and my people, nor can I complain of brothers to whom a man may look for support, however great as war may be. Zeus has made us a race of only sons of Eretus, was only son of Harkisius, and Odysseus only son of Eretus. I myself only son of Odysseus, who left me behind when he went away, so that I have never been of any use to him. Hence it comes that my house is in the hands of numerous marauders, for the chiefs were all the neighboring islands, Delicium, same, Zacrathinus, as also all the men of Ithaca itself are eating at my house under the pretense of paying forth to my mother, who will neither say point blank that she will not marry nor it bring matters to an end, so they are making havoc of my estate, and before long will do so with myself into the bargain. As you have a rest of heaven, but do you, old friend, you may go at once and tell Penelope that I am safe and have returned from Pylos. Tell it to herself alone and then come back here without letting me anyone else know, for there are many who are plotting mischief against me. I understand indeed you replied to me, yes. You need answer me no further, only as I am going that way. Say whether I had not better let poor Pyrrhus know that you are returned. He used to superintend the work on his farm, in spite of his bitter sorrow at Odysseus, and he would eat and drink at will along with his servants. But they tell me that from the day on which you set out uh, for Pylos, he has neither eaten nor drunk, as he ought to do, nor does he look after his home that sits weeping and wasting the flesh off his bones. More is the pity answer to Telemachus. I am sorry for him, though we must leave him to himself just now. If people could have everything their own way, the first thing I should choose would be to return to my father, but go and give you a message, then make haste back again. Do not turn out your way to tell there it is. Tell my mother to send one of her woman's early with the news at once, and let him hear it from her. Thus did he urge the swine herd. You may therefore took his sandals and down onto his feet and started for the town. Athena watched him well off the station, and then came up to the home of the woman there, wise. She stood against the sound of the entry and revealed herself to Odysseus, but Telemachus could not see her and knew not that she was therefore the gods do not let themselves be seen by everybody. Odysseus saw her and said to the dogs, where they did not bark, but went scared and winding off to the other side of the yards. She nodded her head and motioned to Odysseus, but her eyebrows whereon he left the hut and stood before her outside the main wall of the yards. Then she said to him, Odysseus, no son of Eretus, it is now time for you to tell your son, do not keep him in the dark any longer, but lay your plans for the search of the suitors, then make for the town. I will not be long in joining you, for I am too eager for the prey. As she spoke, she touched him with her golden wand. First she threw a fair clean shirt and cloak about his shoulders, and then she made him a younger and a more imposing presence. She gave him back his color, filled out his cheeks, and Red beard become dark again.
Then she went away, and Odysseus came back inside the hut, and his son was astounded when he saw him, and turned his eyes for the future might be looking upon a god. Stranger said, he have suddenly had you changed from what you were a moment or two ago. You are dressed different, and your color is not the same. Are you some one or other of the gods that live in heaven? If so, be propitious to me till I can make you a due sacrifice and offerings of rock bowl. Have mercy upon me. And Odysseus said, I am no god. Why should you take me for one? I am your father, whose account you grieve and suffer so much at the hands of a lawless man. As he spoke, he kissed the tear fell from his cheek onto the ground, for he had restrained all tears till now. But Telemachus could not yet believe that it was his father, and said, You are not my father, but some god, and flattering me with the vain hopes that I may grieve. For the more he ran, for no more man could have himself contrived to do as you had been doing. And if you're so old and young, I'm always known as unless a god were with him. A second ago, you were old and old in rags, and now you are like some god who came down from heaven. Odysseus answered Telemachus, You ought not to be so miserably astonished at my being really here. There is no other Odysseus who will come hereafter, such as I am. It is I who have for long wandering in much hardship have gone home in the twentieth year to my own country. What you wonder at in the work of the redoubtable goddess Athena, who does with me whatever she will, for she can do what she pleases at one moment. She makes me like a beggar, and at night I'm like a man with good clothes on my back. It is an easy matter for the gods to live in heaven's make any man look either rich or poor. As he spoke, he sat down until Telemachus threw his arms at his father and wept. They were both so much moved that they cried aloud like eagles or vultures, which crooked talons that have made a robber their half of what's young by her presence. Thus, Michigas did they weep, and the sun would have gone down upon the morning that Telemachus had not suddenly said, In what ship, my dear father, did your crew bring you to Ithaca? Or of what nation did they declare themselves to be? For you cannot have come by land. I will tell you the truth, my son, replied Odysseus, who was the Persians who brought me here. They are great sailors and are in the habit of giving escort to anyone who reaches the coast. They took me over the sea while I was fast asleep in my in Ithaca, after giving me my many presents and bronze, gold, and raiment. These things, by heaven's mercy, are mine concealed in a cave.